All right. How was everyone's Thanksgiving? Or days off, at least, if, if there was no giving of thanks. Is sleep something that has been restored a little? Yeah. Some for sure, some, some maybes. Uh, so I've been talking about exercise, you know, the brain and, and exercise for a while, but I haven't actually talked about it. It's just been in the title, the brain and exercise. So today is the first time where we'll start getting into how does physical activity, how does exercise, and why does exercise uh, affect the brain? How, what are the consequences on the central nervous system, the consequences on cognition, uh, mental processing, memory, after you ride a bike, or after you go for a jog, or do weight training, or something like that. So today we'll introduce the topic of exercise and uh, cognitive health, neural health, and look at some of the past studies, some of the literature that's been done on it. And then on Wednesday, we will talk about prescriptions, exercise prescriptions, and supplements, things that you can, you can take, the nootropics. Uh, so what can you eat and what can you do? How can you behave? to enhance memory and cognitive function and to fend off cognitive decline in like, you know, 60 years. Uh, and so those relationships and, and the prescription of them we'll talk about next time. And then on Friday, we have April uh, coming in. I update the points. So there's your team's points. Um, and there was one, um, I, can't, I can't remember who won. There's a couple of them that were really close. I, I emailed the winner, you won, but it was by like 0 0.01 points. But I, I emailed everybody their, their points from the, the latest case studies. Um, and uh, so there was one thing that I put in. Remember, if you're working with, with older adults, you want to do the basic assessment, the evaluation of risk factors, but there are also um, additional assessments to do with older adults, people who might not have the physical functioning that they had in youth, somebody who's 20 years past youthful hip mobility, someone whose bones are 20 years past the ability to withstand an impact of a fall. You want to uh, survey people a little bit uh, more. Now from Ractomycin, there was a really nice table. And so I decided to immortalize it in the slides. Uh, but any major signs or symptoms uh, or of, of risk factors using ACSM's 2030 guidelines, remember, because this takes place as friends versus predator in 2030. And if there's no, check again, right? And you'll probably turn up something. Yes, uh, you'll have them get their health checked out just in case. Are they 65 or older? Yes or no. And so you can follow that little maze in a really effective way uh, as you consider how to work with older adults. There's going to be a lot of box checking, right? There's going to be, you know, when like a pilot or whoever the crew is, um, they have that list of things they have to do. And I'm sure most of you know that list better than I do. I would be inventing things about fuel and, and I know nothing else about airplanes. Um, but there's a list, you have to just go through that list and be really cautious because if you miss something on that list, it could be catastrophic. And yeah, it's all common sense and you're gonna remember it and why you need the list until you forget one of them. Just by accident, something happens, you're distracted, you forget one of them, catastrophe happens. Why didn't I think of, whatever. So having things like this are really useful. They're really valuable. So you can reference that list. So really fast through brain waves. You know, we have a bunch, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, a bunch of different brain waves and just different Hertz. They're, they're going at different Hertz and you can get an EEG and figure out what those things are. Um, your sensory input can affect them. Your brain waves can also uh, affect you know, cognitive and motor function, as well as the other way around um, in, in terms of the influence. And flow states, the zone, brainwave patterns are likely to be detectable, are likely to be consistent in one basketball player and another basketball player. Those brainwave states, when they're really 
uh, performing at their peak are likely to be replicable. They're, they're likely to be consistent across people. But as you get into different exercise settings, different tasks, different sports, um, different environments, you're going to see different manifestations of those oscillations, different presentations of, of the brain waves. So, you know, dancers and fastball sports, remember this stuff about, you know, whether it's baseball or, or the biathlon where you're like skiing and then you're shooting a gun, you're going to have different brain waves that are going to correspond to optimal performance while you're skiing and while you're shooting. So it's not just, well, here's what athleticism is. Uh, it, it depends where you are in the brain. It depends uh, what point in the game you are or the, or the performance. Is this a pre-action, readiness, action? Are you evaluating what you just did? Um, so the brain waves are, are, when they are optimal, depend on the situation, depend on the scenario. You can get them while doing math, right? I think many of us are not likely to experience this zone uh, during math, but it's possible uh, to get it. You can be taking GREs, SATs, MCATs, whatever, and, and find yourself in the zone. Uh, but also these brain waves, there's a lot of information left to be understood. We don't really know everything about these. And what is left to be understood may be quite important because we can see changes in brain waves and patterns of brain waves that um, predispose people or flag a coming foible. You know, some, some little mistake, some error. You can see it in the brain before you see it in the hands, in the actions, in the errors. And so there's a lot to be understood there. There's also a lot to be understood from the perspective of, say, athletic training, um, injury rehabilitation. Um, when we're looking at concussions, there are differences that manifest in brain brainwaves. It's not just, you know, testing memory. Let's, let's see what your memory is like today. We'll do some little standardized challenge. That's not it. That's not all the brain does for you. Um, again, if you wanted to look up a, a, an article, just on one of these, this is the best one that I've encountered. Hypofrontality, remember transient hypofrontality, temporary, acute, readily reversible, um, it's very temporary, and then you get your, you know, frontality back intact. Uh, Daniel Simons, he's the one who did that gorilla. And if you become hyper-focused, if you're given clear instruction, and you are very focused on that, on that instruction, uh, or whatever the goal or purpose that you have is, uh, the periphery just vanishes. You get this figurative tunnel vision that functions sort of literally as tunnel vision. All you're seeing is your goal, your purpose, um, fulfilling your instruction, whatever. That's all you see. And so the gorilla comes in and beats its chest right here, and you don't see it because you're so focused on the task. And so very clear goals um, give us very narrow uh, vision. And looking at the, the hypofrontality, part of it is losing yourself in that task. Part of it is going to be this lack of self-awareness. You know, you're not thinking about when you're on the court, let's just say it's basketball, you're on the court, you're not thinking about, oh, I didn't iron my shorts. Like, oh, my shoe is not properly tired. You, you don't think about any of that stuff. The ball needs to get in the hoop and that's the only thing you see. Gorillas on the court, that's fine. You know, as long as I don't, they're not in the way of the pass. Um, and so this idea of losing oneself in the task, the superior frontal gyrus, this is one of those brain regions. And all of these studies about these brain regions, part of how we know what they do um, is, I mean, you can do like MRI studies, stuff, but part of what we know, a lot of, of how we've come to know what these do is have lesions there. Right, have brain damage or, or lesions appear in some particular brain region. And then whatever changes in the mindset and the capacity and the, the type of thinking, you know, or motor function or whatever it is. Oh, that's what that brain region was doing. And so you can't really induce this, um, you know, just in, you know, put some lesions in there deliberately. Uh, but the data, even though it's been studied for a while, our understanding here is still very young. Um, so the superior frontal gyrus, 
uh, sort of our, our philosophical sense of self. We don't need that uh, when the lion is chasing us. You know, we don't, we don't need to think about, oh, you know, do I oatmeal raisin cookie? You, you don't need to think about things uh, in that moment. Uh, the superior parietal lobule, that's another one. Um, this is your uh, geometry, your internal geometry. Here's where I end, and here's where the next thing begins. And, um, and so our, our relationship with space. Uh, so this, like, I am at one with nature. Or, you know, when somebody does, say, LSD, and they just feel so connected to, to everybody in their presence. Like, oh, we are one. We are the same. My feelings are your feelings. We're just, we happen to have two separate bodies, but barely. You know, it's, it's that sort of, and, and I don't know, that's probably everybody at a rave is, is probably experiencing some sort of hypofrontality um, with the, with the concoction. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's Woody Allen's, I am too with nature. I don't, I don't think he was going to many raves. Um, but this, this hypofrontality, this idea of expanding horizons is literally um, a retraction, uh, a reduction of, of brain activity. Is, is the, I'm, not, I'm not condemning this idea of like open your mind, expand your horizons. It's sort of literally the opposite of what's happening, but the perception the perception is potentially a very valuable one for empathy and humanity and understanding of, of you know, compassion. Um, but it, what we see in a lot of these situations is, is a hypofrontality. Um, dorsolateral prefrontal uh, cortex. This is the impulse control. This is self-doubt. This is questioning, is this the right decision? You know, making those sorts of second guesses not helpful in a fast break not helpful when you need to make an immediate decision. Um, and so we can, we can shut that down and free up some resources uh, to use other parts of the brain just to make that decision. Um, and we do, we do keep um, style or preferences or personality. There, there's, they, some of that remains intact in performance. You find yourself completely in the zone, right? You are at the casino on your 50th cigarette in the last nine minutes and you just keep pulling that thing, but you're pulling it like yourself. You haven't become an automaton fully, right? You still have a little bit of personality. Um, you know, your, your choice of little like hairy troll. What are those things called? Trolls, okay, <laughs> the little trolls. <laughs> and then the time dilation, the time dilation part is multifaceted. Um, shut down multiple brain regions and you might lose perception of time. Time is fascinating because, um, you know, sometimes you fall asleep and you think a minute's gone by. Other times you fall asleep, you're like, okay, I have to wake up at 5 a.m. And you wake up at 4.58, you know, without an alarm. You know, so, so our, our tracking of time is a, is a fascinating phenomenon. But a lot of it um, in our waking uh, uh, assessment of, of how much time has elapsed is how much information did we process, how many things happened. And if we can take in more information, right, if we can take in more information uh, with this neurochemical concoction um, and process it more and come up with more answers, uh, we think more time has passed than it actually has. So taking in more information, norepi, um, dopamine, we're getting a creative in our problem solving and our solutions and our, our puzzling together of, of sort of disparate, you know, it's just trying to figure out the, the, the riddle here uh, with dopamine. Anandamide helps with that lateral thinking. It helps be more creative. Uh, connecting some, some synapses that, that might not have otherwise been friendly. Um, so that's going to be the anandamide. So with those three, right, with norepi, let's get in more total information. Uh, with dopamine, let's try to solve, let's try to come up with decisions and, and, and solve what needs solving. And with anandamide, let's get creative in our problem solving. Let's see this through a different perspective. Let's think about this differently. Uh, we can come up with some, some pretty fast solutions that we wouldn't have thought of uh, if we were just normal, right? If we weren't all zoning, if we weren't flowy. Uh, you know, endorphins, endogenous morphine, what we don't want is to be inhibited. We don't want to be uh, to feel 
restricted in some way and pain or fear of pain um, these things can inhibit us they, they can they can prevent us from from diving in head first and the head first dive is usually what's necessary but if we're worried about you know if, if we experience pain or have a fear of pain that can inhibit that dive um serotonin that's the afterglow let's let's um reflect on what just happened with something of a high and and sort of find ourselves basking in uh the series of events that just took place and then we can identify what worked what didn't work what we need to do again you know, what was effective what we would do differently those reflections help us to make better decisions in the future okay so are we good with that part moving into exercise um, let's start with blood flow how the brain receives blood flow the brain needs a lot of blood if you deny the brain nerves neurons they do not tolerate ischemic conditions ischemia neurons not that's not good um, some tissues can tolerate ischemia pretty well not neurons we need a lot of blood flow there we need a lot of oxygen and originally this is a 2000 article it's not that old Back then, way back then, it was believed that during exercise, the blood flow to the brain was relatively constant to what it is during rest. You're lying around, you're exercising, whatever it is you're doing, the brain's blood flow in total, not particular regions, but in total, the brain's blood flow remains constant. So that was in 2000. You don't have to fast forward the world very far before people realize that's not true, right? From 2007, you know, originally found to, to receive steady blood flow. You know, that's what this one was saying, steady blood flow, 2000, 2007. Originally thought to receive steady blood flow, the brain has shown to experience increases in blood flow during exercise. So particular regions will, will experience this differently uh, but the whole brain receives additional surplus blood flow uh, during exercise. So cerebral blood flow, CBF. You know, while increase in metabolism may be the causative factor, right, the underlying factor. So if you go to the masseuse, this is the example I always use. You go to the masseuse and they're like, I'm massaging you. Um, I'm increasing blood flow in that tissue. The tissue that's receiving the most blood flow is formed to the masseuse because metabolism drives blood flow. Wherever there's a metabolic need, blood flow responds. We're going to get blood flow going to where metabolism demands it go. And so metabolism is one of these causative factors for the increase in cerebral blood flow during exercise. But there's other stuff too, um, you know, vessel diameter, um, muscle mechanoreceptors matter too. So indicators of metabolism, indicators of need are also going to send the message that we need more blood to go to the brain. We need more oxygenation uh, to be available at the brain. So this one is just, here's a bunch of things that affect cerebral blood flow. A bunch of stuff, the bold arrows mean these things really drive it up. Total cardiac output, if your heart is spitting out more blood, sure, more of that's gonna go into the brain. Um, blood pressure, arterial blood pressure, sure. Carbon dioxide, sure. But other stuff matters too. Um, catecholamines matter as well. Um, lactate matters, those mechanoreceptors matter. Other stuff also affects uh, how much blood is going to the brain. But again, those neurons, you need blood flow, you need oxygen, you need, you need glucose and, and ketones and potentially lactate, you need energy. Um, you can't do without them. And there's four vessels that you're getting all of that sustenance into the brain through. Um, you have two vertebral arteries in your vertebrae inside of a vertebra, right? So in your vertebral arteries, you have a pair of those, and then you have a pair of carotids, you know, outside of your bones. So a pair of carotids and a pair of vertebral arteries. And 
is probably pretty well balanced. How much blood is getting into the brain through those four I-5s, right? You have four highways getting up there. It's probably pretty well balanced between them in humans. Now, during exercise, how do we get more? We need more. We need more oxygenated blood to the brain during exercise. Well, how do we get more? Um, over here, um, cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen. This is just you know, how much oxygen do we need to consume in the brain? Well, here's rest, right? Bless you. You get into submaximal exercise, maximal exercise. The metabolic need increases, increases, increases. The higher the intensity, the higher the need for oxygen, the higher the metabolism of oxygen. And you're going to meet that metabolism no matter what. Your, your brain, but it's just like when people say, um, oh, you're pregnant, <clears throat> don't you know, do too vigorous of exercise because you'll deplete uh, the baby's you know, oxygenation. The blood supply to the baby is gonna be compromised by you. No, it won't. You will pass out, pregnant mom, um, pregnant soon to be mommy. You will pass out because you will be depleted. The baby's gonna be fine right? The body is going to protect. I mean, it's those gamma globins. It, that, that is really going to siphon off all the oxygen it needs. And what, what gets used up is you. Your brain is not going to allow you to exercise past the point of brain damage. It just won't happen. And so there's uh, peripheral fatigue or cellular fatigue, mechanisms that would shut us down in the periphery. And then there's central fatigue. Central fatigue, you're not going to overcome that, depending on the manifestation of central fatigue. You can't overcome very parts of central fatigue, the psychological fatigue, let's call it. Um, there are placebo trials where you can totally overcome the psychological stuff. But if you're up against brain metabolism, and if you keep exercising, you're going to experience, you know, neuronal damage, no way your body's going to allow you to keep exercising. Remember that exercise happens in your brain, the primary motor cortex and cerebellum. So central fatigue never actually happens? Uh, it's a really good question. Central fatigue, maybe, it might be the major cause of fatigue. Uh, it's really hard because we can, there's a bunch of very specific things that we can point to uh, in the periphery and say that's causing fatigue. We can say the accumulation of phosphates. There's a couple of very specific things. The accumulation of phosphates will do. It'll, it'll muck up um, cross bridge cycling, and those phosphates um, can bind to calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and, and prevent the release of calcium. So that there's some, some very specific things that build up of ADP, uh, magnesium. Uh, there's all these specific things you can point to in the periphery and say, that's it. That's what's causing fatigue. You know, reduced ATP and the, the, the ratio of ATP, AMP, ADP. So. But how do you separate those from the brain just saying, nah, no thanks. The brain receiving input, the brain being like, ooh, I'm detecting, um, you know, the phosphate and ATP, ADP and the, and the pH and, and all this stuff. I'm noticing all of that. And so I'm shutting you down. While there are cellular explanations to point to and say, that makes sense. I see how it's obstructing cross bridge cycling, or I see how it's obstructing calcium kinetics, something like that. What seems more believable to me is that central fatigue is more powerful, more inhibitory uh, to our functioning. And uh, but that's sort of beside the, the point here is the fatigue part. But we need, what we need to get blood flow to the brain. If we don't have that, that's something uh, more inhibitory than mere fatigue. That's cessation of exercise entirely. So we increase the intensity and what we see is an increased metabolic uh, demand and use um, for and of oxygen. Now, um, cerebral blood flow at submax, we get an increase submaximum intensity. So start to increase in intensity and cerebral blood flow of the availability of blood itself goes up. And then it goes back down as you hit the maximum exercise. The amount of blood going to the brain decreases. And so then what happens is you sort of taking more oxygen out of what's taking more nutrition out of what's there at maximum exercise. The AVO2 difference. 
So at that submaximal exercise, you really need that metabolism largely by sending more blood. And when you get higher and higher in intensity, you don't have that luxury. And so you need to extract, uh, make more use out of the resources that are available. Does that make sense? Um, now you're at rest, you take a bunch of oxygen and carbohydrate. Um, but then we also, so there's regional cerebral blood flow to consider, right? The amount of blood getting there. Um, the cerebral metabolic rate for glucose, the brain is the primary, because the central nervous system is the primary consumer of glucose. Um, your neurons are not going to touch fat. They are sugar hungry and ketone hungry and uh, uh, lactate hungry. Um, and a cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen. So all of these things we have to consider. Now this right here is a look at the um, cerebral blood flow with the intensity. Here's rest and here's the amount of cerebral blood flow. Um, you get up to about 100% exercise intensity and you're pretty much back to rest and how much blood is going to the brain. So you have to meet it with other means. Somewhere in the middle of your maximum capacity, over here you're resting, over here you're going all out, somewhere in the middle um, is where you are receiving the most blood, the most actual like liters of blood uh, finding its way there. Now, um, here's rest. This is energy, this is energy uh, resources, energy substrates. Okay, there's oxygen. Oxygen goes up and there's exhaustion. Here's rest and you're like heaving and hoeing and now you're exhausted, whatever. Oxygen demand goes up, sure. Glucose goes up a little, but look at lactate. Lactate consumption, the brain takes up lactate during exercise. Now, during, during rest, you're releasing some. During rest, lactate release during recovery the end of recovery you're still releasing lactate during exercise the brain is a sponge for lactate it is absorbing lactate and getting uh, fuel out of it part of the brain's metabolism a large part a huge part of the brain's metabolism is met by lactate so lactate isn't just some waste product if the heart uses it for fuel, the brain uses it for fuel. Um, and so during maximal whole body exercise though, um, cerebral oxygenation does decrease a little bit. Blood flow decreases substantially and oxygenation decreases a little bit. If you give supplemental oxygen during exercise, you perform better depending on the exercise. During vigorous, aerobic exercise, if you provide, you know, an oxygen tank, you're going to perform way better. You're, there's not going to be so much labored breathing um, and your tissues will be, will be well saturated with oxygen much more than if you didn't have, just like if you go up at altitude and, and try to exercise, you're going to perform worse. At altitude, partial pressure of oxygen goes down, you're going to perform worse. If you provide supplemental oxygen, you're going to perform uh, better, and a lot of that is cerebral oxygenation, because that gets a little bit hard at high intensity exercise. Cerebral oxygenation becomes a challenge, and so that can be part of the fatigue, part of what makes you stop exercising. And then there's other stuff, glycogen depletion in the astrocytes, right? That messes with metabolism. So glycogen availability, carbohydrate availability. Um, messes with the central nervous system's uh, metabolism as well. Okay, are we all right with the uh, blood flow in the brain? We need blood. We need a lot of it. The brain is a huge consumer of glucose, ketones, and lactate. And we need a lot of oxygen and a lot of those things uh, to be able to exercise well. Now, um, <clears throat> talking about brain damage and uh, brain regeneration and uh, the, the relationship to exercise has on those things and behaviors have. When I was growing up, there was this, it wasn't really a wives tale. It was like an old peers tale, like P-E-E-R-S. Um, an old elementary school peers tale where 
if you damage brain cells and like everything damages brain cells, ooh, did you have a sip of beer? Ooh, did you like watch TV too much? Ooh, did you not get enough sleep? Ooh, did, whatever. Like, oh, you know, the tennis ball hits you in the forehead. Everything is causing brain damage. And now you're born with all the brain cells you're gonna get and they never grow back. That was the slogan and the, I don't know, wisdom, the threat, right? That was the, um, the fear of, of degeneration, you know, in like, I don't know, this kid's 10 or something, and uh, is worried about his brain shrinking already. Um, and so, but he was, I mean, so like, watch TV too much. Oh, you know, every time, you know, there were all these statistics when I was growing up, not on the internet, because that didn't exist. But you'd be presented with these statistics about how many brain cells are killed, are just strangled and slaughtered uh, by every activity that we do. And they never go back. That's what was always, what was always said. Uh, and then comes 1998, November, so I was, I was uh, 18 uh, at that point. And uh, Peter Erickson and Fred Gage, it's Fred Gage's lab, senior author here. This is the first time, 1998, the first time that the regrowing of neurons was demonstrated in people and human beings. It was a bunch of like, cancer patients who, who donated their bodies to science. And, and it, um, but they had demonstrated this in, in rodents and in monkeys. But people always say, yeah, but animal models. Yeah, but animal models. Yeah, but that's rats. Yeah, but that's mice. Yeah, but that's monkeys. I'm a person. You know, I am not among the animal kingdom. Um, but then what it comes down to is you always end up seeing the same exact thing in, in people. And, but this was the first time uh, that we saw that, that scientists demonstrated and, and readers saw uh, neurogenesis, right, in the, in the hippocampus. And so the hippocampus you can think of as consolidation of memory, right? You go out and experience the world and you collect observations and short-term filing of those things. You're gonna filter through them and decide what to log in long-term memory. The hippocampus is critical for that stuff. And so when we're looking at neural functioning and memory and, and cognitive performance, the hippocampus is one of these major hubs of the brain. And the way I describe it here is, is uh, a holding room for memory, right? So it's processing paperwork and trying to um, decide on its importance and it's, it's how deserving it is to, to reside in the brain long-term. Some info will make it through customs, but not all of it, right? This is the hippocampus making those executive uh, decisions. And we have seen, now it's not, pronounced. It's not profound. It's not like, well, I regenerate a new one, like, you know, a salamander tail or whatever. It's not that big. It's a very modest effect. But a modest effect is an effect, right? There is an effect that has been observed. It's not as though neurons never regrow. It is challenging and it, and it is limited. And, and um, there's, uh, this, this is what provides room for the Travis Styles of the world to say, how do we make this happen um, unobstructed? We're less obstructed. How do we make um, neurons, how, how, you know, how do we give birth to some new neurons uh, without all of those um, impediments that you see in the central nervous system? In the periphery, easy, super easy in the periphery. Possible in the central nervous system, and it does happen but it's just, it's, it's minimal, but there are some things that help trigger it. Now, exercise is one of those things. Exercise is a really important and potent stimulator of neurogenesis, but learning is not just in brain health and, and skill development and learning a new language and, and you know, learning an instrument or any, any type of skill acquisition or cognitive recall, any of that stuff. It's not just neurogenesis. The improved circuitry, the synapses, the, the neuronal health um, matters too. 
And that tends to be what changes the most. And exercise is, it has a huge influence on that, bigger influence than it does on, on sprouting new neurons. Now, most of the research is actually on exercise. Most research on neurogenesis and, and um, you know, neuronal health and, and sprouting of dendrites and, and all of this research, the bulk of it is actually on exercise, but it's not conducted by people who give a shit about exercise. Exercise creates an environment, a physiological, biological environment that is conducive to neuronal health. Exercise creates an environment that allows neurons to thrive and not die. If you figure out the components of that environment, if you figure out the factors, the proteins, right? If you figure out the neurotransmitters, if you figure out that environment, you can administer it without a treadmill. You can administer it without dumbbells and, and an exercise bike or like a, a sports field. You can administer that through syringes and pills. And, and so that's the reason pharmacology is so interested in exercise, not because they care about exercise itself, but because it is the most reliable way to uh, foster neuronal health. And it's not direct, it's not like exercise. Oh, I'm exercising, let me get healthy. There's intermediates, right? There's middlemen. Um, and figuring out what those are. So we know BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. We talked all about that one. It works a lot like IGF. Um, the signaling cascades that it, that it goes through, um, you know many of them. And so what is really the most reliable way to get a bunch of BDNF, to get brain-derived neurotrophic factor? This is the guy, uh, he's at UC Irvine who, to my knowledge, is the first one to have ever discovered the relationship between exercise and BDNF. You can look them up online. Um, but this is the article. All of these articles, again, will be available on the site. Um, but finding that BDNF and exercise are connected. Go exercise for a while, and you will get this release of BDNF. Here, we report evidence that physical exercise can increase BDNF gene expression in specific brain regions. So, you know, and a lot of the work, you know, let's put mice on wheels. And, um, but increasing BDNF, it's not, it's not that old. I mean, this is from 1995. So this is still relatively new. Fast forward the world, I don't know, 12, 10 years, a decade. Um, and we start to look at, we start to look at um, how BDNF and learning are related. Cognitive functioning, learning, how are these things related to exercise? And the initial studies, as always, are animal models. Let's use a bunch of mice. So they take these mice, they put them into four groups, okay? There's um, the young and the old, and among each of those categories, there's exercising and sedentary. So there's a young control, we're not exercising. There's an old control, old mice that aren't exercising. There's young exercisers and there's old exercisers. And then they do this sort of weird experiment. It's, it's a reliable one. Many studies have done it. We'll talk about another study that uses this exact same method. But there's this tank of water and they put in this like non-toxic paint. They're gonna kill the mice at the end. <laughs> but they, they make a point of saying, uh, with white non-toxic paint, but you're gonna, in five days, the mouse is dead. <laughs> anyway, however, uh, the toxicity, maybe there are implications about, you know, BDNF and, and um, neuroplasticity, maybe you could impair that stuff. So there's this, there's this water and it's, it's opaque, it's, it's, you, you can't actually see through it, it's cloudy. But there's a little platform in there, just, just beneath the surface, you can't see it. You have to swim around, the mice have to swim around and find that platform. 
and they start measuring things. You know, they put the platform in the same place, you know, day after day, and, and put the mice somewhere else in the tank. And there's the exercisers and the non-exercisers. There's the old and, and the young mice. And which mice remember where that platform was? Put them anywhere in that tank and they go, and they're on the platform. You know, how long does it take them to find that platform? Um, are they able to locate it or do they just swim around for 40 seconds? Like, oh, you know what, your turn's up, you're out of here. Um, and so this, looking at the effects of exercise on that particular outcome. Um, and then at the end, at the, at the end of I think the fifth day, uh, what they do is they take the platform out and they put the mice in the tank and they measure how long the mice go to where the platform should be. It's like, oh, I know it's here. It's, I know it's here. And then like, you do this where the platform is. Um, and then some mice just never don't even remember where the platform is. There isn't one and they're just looking for it. Like, oh, there's gotta be one here somewhere. But they have no idea where it was before. Um, so that last trial, how much time the mice spends where the invisible platform should be, where that platform uh, should live. And so that's looking at the recall ability, the memory. I know it's here. I have spatial recall, spatial memory. And um, so, you know, interestingly, I, I always hate it. Don't, don't put this in your literature. Interestingly, comma, let the reader decide if it's interesting. Just state the fact. And as a reader, I'll let you know if I found that interesting. So let's pop up that word. The probe trial uh, indicated that old runners may learn better than young controls. So the elderly mice, an elderly within a mouse population is not that much time on a calendar, but old mice may have better cognition if they're exercising than young mice do if they're not exercising. Lots of implications there about how we should conduct ourselves in life, how we should be behaving uh, in life. Um, new neurons, right? They kill the mice at the end and they're gonna look at their brains. New neurons in the exercisers, a lot more neurons in the young mice. The young mice, oh, those brains are plastic. Those brains can grow. Let's get more neurons, neurogenesis in the young exercisers and some neurogenesis in the old exercisers too. The brains themselves grow, enlarge, develop. And so these are um, the young runners. I mean, tons of these, of these new neurons in, in the young runners. The old exercisers, right? The old exercisers, not as many. We look at the young and the old, but that's still new, that's enhancement. That's, that's improvement. And so as these mice exercise, they're improving. I mean, just look at the cell number, you know, young, young runner. Oh, that goes up, right? Old, old runner, totally goes up. Percentage of neurons, oh, goes up. Old to old runners, goes way up. Exercise is very valuable at neurogenesis and learning, not just the physical structure, the meat of the brain, but the functioning of that meat. How clearly and effectively do you think? How well, how accurately do you remember? That is affected by exercise an awful lot. Now this is the opposite study. It's essentially the same thing. They use a water tank and everything, but um, they're blocking BDNF. So what they did, um, a bunch of mice, right? There, there are a bunch of mice in here and uh, rats, this is rats. <coughs> I wrote mice, they wrote rats. Take the actual article quotation. Um, and they have a fine setup, you know, whatever. It's not something I would choose if I were a rat. That, that would be my ideal uh, setup. But some of them had a running wheel and others didn't. And so there was an exercise group and a non-exercise group and just like the last study had four categories. So does this one. Exercise with a BDNF blocker. Okay, so do all the exercise you want, we're blocking BDNF. So you don't get the brain-derived neurotrophic factor effect of the exercise. Let's see if exercise still works. Two, exercise without a BDNF blocker. So there's exercise and exercise with a BDNF blocker or without. And then there's sedentary, uh, in the same conditions with and without the BDNF blocker. 
And then they looked at this exact same thing, right? The same experiment. Let's sort of torture you in a weird aquatic way. Um, and when they blocked BDNF, the exercise without the BDNF blocker worked exactly as they assumed it would, exactly as it does in other trials, exactly as the expectation, oh, it's perfect. Exercise with the BDNF blocker, you might as well be sedentary. You don't get the enhanced recall, cognition, you know, however you want to characterize the success of that trial, um, they didn't get it. Um, and, and looking at this, this inhibition of the signaling cascades, you remember how these signals work, IGF-2, they specifically mentioned that previous findings show that BDNF and IGF-1 um, share common signaling cascades. Um, both of these things, but if you're blocking them, if you block the signaling, you don't get neurogenesis. You don't get enhanced memory and performance. None of those things develop if you're blocking the factors that exercise makes you release. Um, so this is just their discussion, right? In conclusion, the findings suggest that BDNF is really a critical part. It's not just a part, it's a critical part of a central mechanism through which physical activity integrates with elements of energy metabolism, right? Uh, cerebral energy metabolism, just as peripheral. I think IGF is a lot of maintenance of peripheral energy as well as, as central. Um, but you know, the, the, um, you know, all this stuff is developed to maximize motor operations that increase the chances of obtaining food and the probability of survival. I'm gonna come back to this point somewhere near the end. Uh, the reason exercise, the why, the reason that exercise is so critical, so connected to cognition and brain health. Um, but here's um, sedentary control, exercise without the BDNF blocker, and then you know, exercise with the BDNF blocker, sedentary with the BDNF blocker. You just, uh, BDNF is such a critical um, mechanism, such a, a, a critical road that synaptic plasticity must travel. It's one of the major means for brain health. But this book is, is getting a little bit old. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's just getting a little bit old. Um, but talking about BDNF, you know, as the stories of BDNF and exercise developed in parallel, it became clear that BDNF was important not merely for the survival of neurons, but also for their growth sprouting new branches and thus for learning. Um, looking inside their brains, researchers determined that mice without BDNF lose their capacity for long-term potentiation, learning. Conversely, injecting BDNF directly into the brains of rats encouraged long-term potentiation. And so there's stuff that you can do to increase BDNF. There's stuff you can, um, activities you can do, exercises you can do, there's stuff you can take and eat um, to increase BDNF, but in general, um, increase BDNF, you increase learning, you enhance learning. Neutralize BDNF, inhibit BDNF, reduce it, and you impair learning. So BDNF is one of the most critical ones. Now, in people, you can't neutralize BDNF like you can in a mouse. I guess it's just as cruel to neutralize it in mice. If we were like mice philosophers, we would say, no, do it in people. We, we, you know, so. Oh, did those studies touch upon the, I guess, the complexity of the learning? So like, was it super complex, like, uh, for human like learning the language? Or just in sports, it's like learning that you have to run into this case, you have to run this off. So for mice, you know, it's not gonna be like learning vocabulary. Uh, for people, it is. That's often what it is, is learning vocabulary. Um, and, you know, all of these little kind of memory tests um, that, that are sort of common. Um, but, you know, a lot of it's going to be learning vocabulary, stuff like that, and people. But mice, you know, it's just recollection of spatial processing. Has there been any study or discussion about how that can translate to human? Uh, there are generalizations 
about how this translates to people. But there is a lot of research on people and I'll talk about more of it, a little bit more today, but then also more on uh, Wednesday um, in people and the types of, of exercise that facilitate it um, and then the types of, of outcomes that we see. It's young, the field is young. And so when I'm giving exercise prescriptions, take that with a grain of something more grainy than salt. You know, in 10 years, the science will have um, sorted itself out a little bit more in which exercise prescriptions for cognitive health will have more to say about it. Um, but the current state of evidence on Wednesday, I'll, I'll get into what I, what I think your line of questioning is leading us toward. I, I think I'll be answering a lot of those on Wednesday. Uh, but so people, again, you can't just inject a BDNF neutralizer or something in them. Uh, but there are genetic abnormalities, right? So, so just like we went through those lectures and we were talking about those alleles that we get some nonsense snip here, some frame shift mutation there, you know, we have put some variant, some gene variant causes a defective version of this protein. BDNF, it's a factor, factors are proteins. And so there are genetic mutations and people sometimes have those genetic mutations. Cognition is severely impaired, severely impaired. Just like you see with IGF uh, in development, um, you will see a very similar uh, phenomenon. Um, in aging people, as we age and age and age, I mean, look at a teenager and, and look at that teenager's grandparent. The rapidity of thought, the ease of recall, the attention, the duration of attention one can assign. Let's ignore things like attention deficit disorder and just, and just you know, kind of standardize this. Youth has cognitive advantages. However, exercise helps preserve whatever advantages were once present. A lot of this 2020 article on the benefits of, of um, exercise on Alzheimer's disease. This is another 2020 article on the neuroprotective mechanisms of physical activity in cases of neurodegeneration. Um, and this is a diagram from the article that's just, the rest of this article, again, all of this stuff will be available. You can scroll through it if you want. Um, the rest of the article has even worse diagrams. <laughs> really unbelievable. I, I never quite understand why scientists who do sound work, really good work, scientists, and they put together really appalling diagrams that it looks like was made out of macaroni in you know preschool or something. But the, the studies themselves are, are really good. Um, but this is just an illustration of the breadth of effects that exercise has. Improvement in mood and sleep. That sleep is particularly important. Mood is sort of a consequence. Mood is a consequence of better sleep, right? Mood is a consequence of a reduction in stress and anxiety. Your mood, that's, that's sort of a, a symptom rather than a, a mechanism. A reduction in stress and anxiety, reductions in insulin resistance, reductions in inflammation, that's a huge one. Um, stimulation to release growth factors, that's a huge one. BDNF, IGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, all those factors. Um, growth of new blood vessels downstream from, from VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Improvement in memory and learning. Again, more of a consequence, that one. Um, overall health and, and, and abundance and survival of brain cells. There are a lot of things um, that exercise is doing. So it's not just, oh, BDNF and nothing else. Exercise enacts its enhancement through a bunch of pathways. Same article, uh, you know, physical exercise improves physical performance, mental status, general health, and well-being. I just, I never really like general health and well-being. I, I don't really know what those words mean. Um, but it does so by affecting many mechanisms at the cellular and molecular level. You know, cells like neurons, um, glial cells, and molecular is like molecules. Those aren't cells, right? Physical exercise is beneficial to people suffering from neurodegenerative diseases because it improves production of neurotrophic factors, those proteins, BDNF, stuff like that. Neurotransmitters, norepi, dopamine, serotonin, stuff like that, and hormones. Uh, this is like epinephrine is, is the hormone version of all of that. So exercise does a ton of, of things. Now, um, genetics as well, epigenetics, 
change with sedentary behavior. The control of our genetic expression changes with sedentary behavior in what can be uh, disastrous ways. So our epigenetic uh, influences matter a great deal. What is our DNA actually doing? How is it behaving? Um, but again, we don't, this is a, a nice, this is a 2019 article. It's just saying that we don't have a state of evidence now where we can really reliably say, this is what you should do. Do you have a family history of Alzheimer's? Here's the exact exercise prescription for you. We have ideas, we have generalities, we have exercise prescriptions that are definitely valuable, but improvable. And we'll get to those later. But the mechanisms, how does exercise increase BDNF or enhance um, uh, neuronal health? There's a bunch of stuff. Um, the muscle brain endocrine loop, right? Myokines, you know, cytokines are signaling proteins. A cytokine is a little protein that does signaling. If it's released from a muscle, it's a myokine, a muscle cytokine. Um, so the muscle secretes these myokines um, and that has an effect on, on BDNF. Um, and uh, so like down here, we have the irisin. Uh, we've talked about this one before. We talked about that when we were um, talking about brown fat, stuff like that. Uh, Capsaicin uh, B, that one also. We're looking at downstream beating up, but also um, the ketones. Right, ketones um, seem to have an enhancement of BDNF gene expression as well. So implications with nutrition uh, and the interaction between nutrition and exercise start to form there. So just a couple of diagrams. Uh, that cathepsin B, uh, it's a myokine, muscle releases it. It's a little protein released by muscle, crosses the blood-brain barrier. So exercise causes the muscle to release on this little myokine. That myokine crosses the blood-brain barrier and increases BDNF. Um, and you get hippocampal, uh, the hippocampus, right? Uh, neurogenesis, and then functioning. You get functioning from it. Um, same thing with the ears. It's, it's the same, you know, exercise. This is another factor, and we're seeing this increase uh, in BDNF. So muscle use, skeletal muscle use, exercise, causes the release of factors. Um, and cytokines, myokines. And those proteins will induce neuroplasticity will induce, will, will, will fend off apoptosis, will increase the sprouting of these, of these dendrites. So um, a type of exercise and, and an example of what this might look like, how you can incorporate this. We'll talk about the specifics of prescription soon, but this is a study from 2007 that looked at a, di a few conditions, a control, a moderate and an intense exercise and learning in humans. Right, so there's 27, they're all guys, but uh, 27 male subjects, and there's the three different conditions. Um, at first, 30 minutes of sedentary activity, or non-activity, of sedentism. Um, 30 minutes, go do nothing, and then they get a blood sample. Let's measure some stuff. And then there's three different conditions. Relaxed, right, don't do anything. Uh, moderate exercise, 40 minutes of low intact running. And then there's intense exercise. So these we're separating these groups. Um, two sprints that are three minutes each. So six minutes of exercise with a you know intermission. So there's 40 minutes of exercise, moderate intensity. There's six minutes of exercise, high intensity, two bouts. And then there's do nothing. After that, they do another blood sample. Let's measure stuff again. So that way we can correlate the, the things we've measured, what's in the blood with memory, with cognition. Um, so they take another blood sample and then they do a learning uh, protocol where they learn words in like, you know, an artificial language, right? Just here's sort of random words that it's not possible for you to know. So memorize these words. Um, 
And then immediately after that, they have a retention test, meaning let's see how much you remember. We have the three different groups, the sedentary group, the moderate activity group, and the intense activity group. You just learned a bunch of words. How much do you remember? And let's take one last blood sample and, and see what, what, what their blood looks like. And then let's wait a week, wait a week, bring them back and see what they remember from those words. And then wait eight months, wait eight months, bring them back and see what they remember. What they found was, you know, you know, among younger people, right? So you have to, you can't generalize to, to disparate audiences. Uh, after exercise, they learned about 20% faster. Learned those words. And it's not like strawberry and pear and apple and stuff. That's just, this is just like my clip art addition to the slide. Um, they learned a lot faster, but they also retained. And they found that uh, a correlation with BDNF levels and it says with an ellipsis, meaning I'll talk about epinephrine in just a minute. Um, but this is the intense, so percentage of correct responses, memory. This is accuracy of, of memory and, and retention of, oh, that intense one. That's what worked. Six minutes of exercise worked way better. Here's the, here's the moderate exercise. Ah, I didn't really do that much. Anything like there's some carry. The intense exercise, it was six minutes of exercise. Any of you could do that whenever you want, right? Oh, it's, I have a final tomorrow. Uh, I'm gonna start studying in 10 minutes. Between now and 10 minutes, I'm gonna do two high intensity bouts of three minute exercise. Get on a bike or sprint or do burpees or whatever. And your studying will be more effective. Now, there's a generalization there. I'm, I'm not sure what your final is on, but very likely your studying will be more effective. Now, there were some differences at baseline a little bit. You can see those differences here. There's dopamine. The dark line is the intense exercise, and that's the one to pay attention to because that's the one that works best. Um, norepi, super up, right? Epi, pretty super up. Um, and then there's the BDNF, um, the, the control group. Just nothing really happened to BDNF and the control group. Now, there is a... Even in the control group, you're in an experiment, you're being observed, you're going to have to perform. There's, there's an acute adrenal response that you will, that you will get from that. Um, and so, and even like, you know, with the dopamine uh, response, there, there is a, a stress, there, there is a, a possibility to uh, influence those neurochemicals. But when you see stuff like the, the norepinephrine and the epinephrine going up, and then you see retention after one week, high epinephrine group. Oh, they're way better. Retention after eight months. So eight to 10 months when they brought people back, it's better. Epinephrine with learning. I remember epinephrine, will somebody shut the um, parade out? Uh, epinephrine is the hormonal one, the endocrine one. Norepi is a neurotransmitter one, um, but you get this exaggerated epinephrine response with intense exercise and that epinephrine associated with learning very strongly in the high uh, epinephrine group. And so just the same article looking at the findings of peripheral catecholamines, okay, so um, you know, dopamine and, and epi, peripheral catecholamines, um, and BDNF levels, those things associated with exercise intensity and with learning. Increasing those BDNF and catecholamines is where you see a lot of uh, the responsiveness of our studying, of our efforts to learn and retain. So let's get into function, into practice. And this is, it's, it's characterized in this book well, which is why I put the book up here, it's a nice, source to tell this story. But Philip Lawler was this guy. Here's, I just, I pulled up his obituary. Um, so he is no longer with us. Uh, but he introduced this concept of uh, zero hour PE, right? Or learning readiness PE. So in somebody who is studying or, or championing pedagogy, there really is something to champion. Here. Um, so in, in Naperville, Illinois, it's not huge, right? It's just a little bit outside of Chicago. I've been there. 
um, 14 uh, elementary schools, five um, middle schools, and two high schools. But in this district, um, he started this, this uh, first thing in the morning PE. And what they do for PE is not like stand around uh, waiting for somebody to you know, pick them for kickball or whatever. You run a mile and if uh, put on a heart rate monitor, and if you don't cross the finish line at maximum heart rate, go do it again. I mean, it's, it's strict. I mean, you gotta cross, I mean, because not everybody, it's not timed. Oh, you cross the finish line fast. Yeah, but I was a good runner and I was just, you know, jogging. You better, you better see that maximum heart rate uh, upon crossing the finish line. And this is before the first class, before the first class that they had. So they enter the first class out of breath and sweaty and stinky and whatever, um, and not with an expression that looks like them, with an expression that looks like I was just slaughtered on a, on a track. And then the experiment though, was does this improve academic performance, right? These are primary education students sprinting a mile before first period. And uh, in 1999, they did the uh, TIMS, it's Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. It's like the Olympics for fourth graders and eighth graders, worldwide. Worldwide, all of these countries submit their fourth graders and eighth graders to compete in science and mathematics to see how is the education system working from you know, country to country. Singapore wins everything every year. Um, but then, every four years, rather. Uh, but then seeing how everyone else uh, uh, sort of pans out. Um, so in 1999, uh, Naperville, 97% of its eighth graders took the test. That's not what everyone does. You know, normally, let's send our valedictorians. You know, let's, let's send the best among us. Um, it's not Statue of Liberty, give us your tired and poor and huddled masses and whatever. But Naperville sent their huddled masses. 97% of its eighth graders took the test. There was 59,000 total US students, but Naperville, its eighth graders, really went uh, all out. And this is, again, the zero hour PE. They were sixth in the world, Naperville was, in math, and they were first in the world in science. Illinois, a district in Illinois, was number one in the world in science. Now, get into the US and you have number one in the world and you have the last place in the world. Okay, Jersey City, last in the world in science. Miami, last in the world in math. Naperville, first in the world in science and not too shabby in math. So how we go about education, the, there are no different genomes here. Number one in the world and last place in the world. And the genomes are the same. What do we do with those genomes? How do we educate people? How do we train people? You better incorporate exercise if you don't want to be Miami. Right? You better incorporate exercise. Other people have done this too. Um, and this is another example that I took out of that book. Um, Tim McCord is this guy who implemented it. And he found very similar outcomes in terms of um, academic performance and, and um, who you want to the types of primary education students you want to rear. Uh, we all know, I'm only gonna play the commercial for a second. Um, but I think we all know this commercial probably. You know what 2.30 in the afternoon feels like, right? Sleepy? Do we, do we know this commercial? Time for a nap? What do you do? Run for the clock. Okay, five hour energy. Uh, I, I can't listen to the guy. He makes the same face over and over. Every single time the camera gets on, he makes the same face. His eyebrows up. And, um, but this idea of we're all tired, everyone's tired in life. And it's not because we, we don't have enough five hour energy to take. It's because the conditions of life, or we don't have enough eight hour energy, right? That one seems a little more intense. Or 14 hour energy, all right? That maybe is dangerous. But it's not because we don't have enough energy drinks to take, it's the structure of our lives. Now, the question of why, what is the reason why is exercise so interwoven, so, so intimately connected with mental health, brain health, cognition, memory? Why is it so connected? 
The best example that I know of in nature to illustrate this is the sea squirt. It's this little thing. Now it has a tiny brain. Let's, let's call it a brain. A central nervous system, which is tantamount to a brain. And it moves. It's a mobile creature. 300 neurons or so. It swims around and then it finds a place to dock and it becomes a plant. Do plants have brains? No, trees don't have nervous systems. They don't feel when the hatchet goes in there. I, I can't imagine that they do anyway. They don't certainly don't feel it in the way that, that we understand feeling. Um, and so the, the sea squirt, it then consumes its nervous system for fuel because it doesn't move anymore. So what does it need a brain for? If you don't move, there's no need for a brain. Only mobile creatures need brains. Movement is made by the brain. The brain is what permits movement. And movement enhances the brain. If you stop moving, what do you need a brain for? Any activity that you do is going to be planned by the brain. Your brain makes a bunch of predictions about what's going to happen, estimations of trajectories or your behavior or whatever. Um, it, it, it rehearses those, it enacts those things, uh, it evaluates our, our activities, it identifies any mistakes that we made, it reflects on them, it tries to correct those mistakes, it identifies what you did right, um, what successes you had, so it can know to repeat those in the future. All of this planning and rehearsal and, and reflection happens in the brain, and it's really about movement. If we don't move, there's no reason to have a brain. All right, and that's it. That's it for today. And then the very last me lecture is on Wednesday, and we'll finish off exercise in the brain. And then on Friday, we will have April um, talking about uh, neural PT. So the, the so really an application, a clinical application um, of a lot of the science. Um, final formulated how it's all the syllabus with the case studies? I think what we'll do for the final is uh, part multiple choice, part case study. Okay. But it'll be a digital one because not everyone, um, I know Liam is already back in, I don't know, he's like Greece or South Africa or something now. I think en route to Australia. So so some people just can't be here. Um, some people are, you know, if, if they don't live in town, they're just gone. And so it'll be an all digital form and part case study, part uh, multiple choice.